Cavalcade of Kings. Richard Lionheart. As the cavalcade of kings rides on, a fierce figure brandishing a mighty battle axe and riding a wild-eyed steed approaches. Tis Richard the First, third son of Henry the Second, surnamed the Lion Heart. He was born on September the 8th, 1157, at Oxford, but was reared among the knights of Point Two in Aquitaine, which duchy was inherited from his infamous mother, Eleanor. Richard was crowned King of England at Westminster on the 5th of July, 1189. On the day of his coronation, he issued a proclamation forbidding the Jews to appear at the ceremony. When, however, great numbers of them, who had already assembled from all parts of the land, bringing presents to show their respect for their new king, ventured down to Westminster Hall with their gifts, they were cordially received and their presents readily accepted. When our story opens, we find Richard at Westminster Hall, together with his brother John and William de Longchamp, whom Richard had created Bishop of Ely. Could see, my brother, that a golden key can open any lock. Which have me deny my subjects the right to witness my coronation? Nay, brother, especially as they have paid for the privilege. I need all the gold I can lay my hands on. Crusading is not the business of a poor man. And I trust God will fill your coffers to overflowing, my son, to enable you to go forth and fight the faith. <laughs> and if he doesn't, the Jews will. <laughs> my son, I protest against your levity, which comes perilously near blasphemy. Spare me your hypocrisy, I pray you. Has forgotten that we've diced together, philandered together, I and lied together when you were plain William de Longchamp. Odd's blood, William. I never thought to see your beetle brow graced by a bishop's mitre. Oh, enough of your malicious tongue. Reminds me of the chattering of a monkey at mating time. You do not appreciate my wit, Richard. Wit is folly unless a wise man has the keeping of it. Then you are neither witty nor wise, but a weathercock who swings round with the wind of the Jew's money bag. Meaning, John? Look ye out of the window. Well, what do you see? A vast crowd of my loyal subjects who await my appearance. Vanity, indeed, is the sixth sense. Nay, my brother, they await the Jews who are foregathered in the audience room, the Jews whom you forbade to appear at your coronation, but whose money bags caused your heart to relent. The money will be spent in the cause of justice. Is that why you put our late father's treasurer in chains and locked him in a dungeon from which he was not released until he had relinquished not only all the crown's treasure, but all his own money, too. Ha, 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 justice. Truly, Richard the Lion-Hearted got the lion's share of the wealth of that wretched man. Hot blood, if you don't curb thy malicious tongue. I'll cast thee in a dungeon or so. I would have excellent company, my brother, for all our old friends and supporters who fought with us against our father are now languishing in prison cells. They were rebels, my son, and as such deserve their punishment. Truly, your brother has shown great wisdom in protecting the land from such traitors. My brother could scarcely have done anything that would have been better instance of his real nature or a better warning to fathers and parasites not to trust in lion-hearted princes. <laughs> I've got the sound of that crowd. They seem to be in ugly mood. I wonder what has angered them. It would seem that the Jews are leaving Westminster Hall as lambs go to the slaughter. What do you mean? Speak little and to the purpose. I mean, my brother, that your people resent the appearance of your Jewish friends at Westminster Hall. Their delicate Christian feelings are outraged. They feel they're being contaminated, polluted by the foul nearness of the children of Israel. And at any moment, your gentle Christian subjects will set upon the Jews and then... Ah, me. If I were a holy man like Longchamp, I would say, God help them. A plague upon them? Do they seek to cause a riot beneath my very windows? Call the guards and have them disperse this troublesome rabble? And spoil a lively entertainment? Not I. Rot your soul for the grinning devil that you are. Oh, brave, don't brandish your mighty battle axe so close to my head, Richard. 
Thy neck is such a puny thing, and the head of your axe must weigh near the 20 pounds. I would not cheat the executioner of a task which no doubt will one day be his. Just the rabbi and some of his people are leaving the hall, my son, and I fear the crowd will do them harm. I must go down to them. But my son, you cannot go alone amongst that thieving mob. I will not be alone. My trusty axe will accompany me and cleave a path to safety for my Jewish subjects, whom I will defend to the death. But Richard failed to quell the rioters who slaughtered hundreds of Jews before their bloodlust was slaked. Shortly after, Richard raised an army and set out on his first crusade, going first to France to meet the king who was joining forces with him. Whilst in France, Richard met Baron Garia of Navarre, whom he afterwards married. We now find them walking in the gardens of her palace. Yea, my sweet Berengaria, when Philip joins me with his troops, our army will number 100,000 men. A formidable host, Richard, that must surely cause Saladin to reflect. Oh, my blood boils when I think of the Mohammedan dogs setting up their mosques on the site once occupied by the temples of Solomon, Serubabel, and Herod. Would that I were a man. If you were, my sweet... I would be robbed of the sweetness of a woman's love. But God would have another holy night to bear the fiery cross of Christianity into the camp of the infidel. Where men and women are butchered in cold blood and where innocent children are dashed to death against the walls of the cities. The fiends. Oh, how could they? How could they? Oh, my darling, you're trembling like a leaf. We must have done with this talk of war, which is men's talk. And not fit for the dainty ears, my sweet Berengaria. Oh, Richard, you are so kind and gentle with me. I bless the day your mother brought us together. So do I, my darling. I fell madly in love with you the moment I set eyes on you. I was rather afraid of you at first. Afraid? Why? Well, you looked like a fierce giant as you rode past at the head of your army on that wild-eyed horse of yours which reared and plunged with fury. And when you brandished your wicked-looking battle axe, you know what I did? <laughs> no, my sweet. What did you do? I ran into my bedchamber and locked myself in. <laughs> I thought you would eat me. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not afraid of me now? Oh, no, Richard. I love you now. And I want you to go on loving me, always. I promise, my darling. God bless you, my dear. And now I shall have to leave you. When do you depart, Richard? Within three days, my beloved. Do you go straight to the Holy Land? No, we go to Messina and Sicily first to teach Tancred a lesson. Tancred? Yes, dear. Your sister, you see, my sister Joanna's husband, the King of Sicily, has recently died, and his uncle Tancred has usurped the crown, cast my sister into prison, and seized her estates. So I am journeying there to demand the restoration of her lands and to place her safely on the throne again. Perhaps when I have settled the affair to my satisfaction, my mother could bring you out to me. We could be married at Cyprus. Oh, Richard, that would be wonderful. Then tis agreed. Now, my beloved, I must join my troops. For if we are to meet Philip at our appointed time, we must march today. Kiss me, my darling. My dear. Now, farewell. Farewell, Richard. God be with thee till we meet again. <laughs> Then follow Richard's fruitless march on Jerusalem, his truce with Saladin, and his return to England. Later he declared war on Philip and landed in France. It is now April the 7th, 1199, and we find Richard besieging the castle of the Viscount of Limoges, whose messenger stands before him. What's blood? So the master refuses to yield to me the treasure of ancient coins which he found on the ground of his castle? My master is willing to yield half of the treasure to thee, sire, which is your just claim, but he will not yield the whole of it. And who is he to dictate terms to his lord and master? Go ye back to him and tell him I will storm his castle and hang every man of its defenders on the battlements. <laughs> I have spoken with King Richard, and he demands that you yield up the old treasure to him. If not, he threatens to storm the castle and hang its defenders. A plague upon him for his greed, my lord. The king and his men have drawn up close to our walls. See, there is Richard now, 
standing alone like the figure of an outraged Vulcan. Ah, a good archer. Good. I never missed, my lord, from my trusty bow. Now I pray God, speed thee well, my arrow. Ah, well done, Bertrand de Gourdon. Your arrow has found its mark. Our score with the lion art is settled. <laughs>